Today I want to speak to you on the subject of what is the unpardonable sin. This is one of those often asked questions that I call a hot potato a biblical question, and it's been difficult for many people to understand and to fully comprehend what the Bible has to say about that. Uh, oftentimes the very brief, uh, almost impulsive answer is given, the unpardonable sin is blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Well, uh, what is blasphemy against the Holy Ghost? But as you're going to learn today, that brief, almost trite answer is not really uh, the full story. The Bible has much to say on this subject of the unpardonable sin. And so thank you for joining us. And whether you're watching uh, via video or uh, some form of social media video or our podcast channel, however you're listening to this, uh, in Matthew chapter 12, we're going to begin. And just before we do, Let's take a moment to bow before the Lord and pray. Father, once again, as we open up the Holy Bible, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. And uh, we pray that by the leading and the wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy Spirit, who is the grandest of all teachers, Uh, The Holy Spirit is above all in teaching, in revealing, in explaining, and in helping every student who calls upon the Lord for understanding. And so anoint our minds today, anoint our memories, let the Word of God go beyond intellectual seedbed, let it go to the very depth of our heart and character, and fashion us and make us more like Jesus I pray for those who may be listening to this teaching today who have never personally or publicly repented of sin and received salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that when the invitation is given at the end of this teaching and that sinner's prayer is prayed, that you'll give people the faith and the courage and the humility to turn from sin and turn to Christ this very same hour, and we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory as we are living in these final moments of Bible prophecy and human history. May each and every one of us live every day ready to meet the Lord, and we pray in the mighty name of Jesus, and we say amen. Matthew chapter 12 And in the 12th chapter of Matthew, go down to verse 22. I'm reading today out of the New American Standard Bible. And we're going to read beginning at verse 22 all the way down through verse 37. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus. And he healed him so that the mute man spoke and saw. All the crowds were amazed and were saying, This man cannot be the son of David, can he? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, This man cast out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, by the way, verse 25, where the scripture says that Jesus knew their thoughts. This is one of the gifts of the Spirit that's available to the believers, as Paul taught in his letter to the Corinthians. And that would be a word of wisdom. Verse 6, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I, by Beelzebul, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges." But if I cast out demons 
by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people. But blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Pause right there. Verse 31, and you might want to highlight that in your Bible. uh, But verse 31 is that text that people oftentimes used when they're asked the question, what is the unpardonable sin? Well, they say, well, you know, Matthew tells us that it's blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. So they're not wrong in saying that. But that is only the doorway into this subject. And there is much in that household of thought, uh, which we're going to uncover for you today. Uh, So let's read verse 31 again. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Verse 32. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, Or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. So there we've read to you out of the 12th chapter of Matthew, uh, one of the classic passages that deals uh, with this subject, what is the unpardonable sin. Uh, This teaching falls under our series of Harmartiology, which is the theology of the study of sin, and obviously what is the unpardonable sin falls uh, under that category of theology. Harmartiology, Harmartiology taken Uh, from hamarsh in the Greek, uh, which means sin. And so uh, this is the study of sin, and what is the unpardonable sin is where we're headed. One of the things that I want you to remember, and I hope that you have written down in your notes concerning uh, this study on hamarshiology and the study of sin, is this most fundamental truth. And as I said in other teachings, If there's only one thing that you learn in our Bible study on hamartiology and the study of sin, it is this. Uh, The most fundamental of all things we learn in the study of sin is God is holy and we by nature are unholy and sin separates us from God. Sin will always separate you from God. Now, as a believer, believers have received forgiveness through Christ and through the sacrifice made on the cross. And so what happens when a believer sins? Well, the Bible tells us in 1 John, if we confess our sins, and notice that in 1 John, the scripture says, if we, uh, John is writing to the church. Uh, Again, always important in your understanding of studying the Bible, understand the author, understand the audience, 
understand the culture. And I oftentimes add to that the literary genre, but that's uh, not as critical as those first three for the average believer. So John is the author, his audience is the church, and he said to those believers, if we confess our sins, believers should not sin. We should strive for holiness. Uh, We've been given the mandate by Scripture and by God the Father, be ye holy even as I am holy. So just because you're a believer does not mean you have a license to sin. Uh, The Apostle Paul wrote, Should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. And so the believer is not given a free pass uh, to sin and to live in transgression and iniquity and sin and deceit. No, we've been commanded to live holy, as holy as God is. Now, do you know anyone as holy as God? I do not. But believers sometimes fail. Believers sometimes sin. But we must immediately, upon sin, come to the Father. 1 John says, if we confess our sin. Well, who do we confess sin to? The Father. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And uh, that's a prayer that I pray uh, almost every day of my life. I prayed it this morning as I was praying over my uh, notes and praying over my Bible and preparing to come see you and to speak to you and to teach. Uh, I prayed those very words. Uh, I, I prayed, Father, if there's anything Uh, in my mind, in my life, in my heart, uh, any sin, any stain that would hinder the flow of the Holy Spirit, forgive me today, cleanse me. And we need to be forgiven of sins known and perhaps sins that we're not even aware of. But we need to be mindful that God is holy. Now, as a believer, when you sin, that does not separate you from your relationship with the Lord, if you've come to faith in Christ, if you've personally repented of sin, received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you were to sin, that does not make you unsaved. Uh, It does not violate your salvation. But listen to what I'm about to say. It can hinder your fellowship. It does not violate your relationship but it can hinder your fellowship. You need to come to God immediately upon sin. And as I mentioned, you must every day in your prayers ask God to cleanse. Uh, We live in an ungodly world and uh, sadly we can get adjusted to all of the sin and the unrighteousness and the godlessness and the carnality and the things that we absorb through social media and through entertainment values. We may not even be aware of of how we might be grieving God and grieving the Holy Spirit. And I'm not saying that we should live in a constant state of guilt and, and condemnation, for there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But we must never forget the call to live a holy life. Let me help you with something and encourage you. The greatest key to the blessings of God And God's prosperity and God's favor in your life is holiness. The cleaner you live before God, the greater will be the measure of his favor and blessing and prosperity over you in your covenant. You say, well, is that taught in the Bible? Well, of course it is. I wouldn't tell you something like that. If it weren't found in the scripture, it's found in multiple places. Psalm uh, chapter 84 and verse 11 is the first verse that comes to my mind. There the Bible says, No good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. Uh, When you walk uprightly, that's holy, that's righteous, that's clean, pure, undefiled. When you walk uprightly in the presence of God, 
No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And so we must never, ever compromise on the issues of sin and carnality and the frailties of the flesh. And as you learned in the study, what is sin? We went to Psalm 32 and we uncovered four words penned by the psalmist David in verses 1 and verses 2 of Psalm 32, where David gave to us four categories of sin. He spoke about transgression he spoke about sin, he spoke about iniquity, and he spoke about deceit. And these were not synonyms, these were different categories of sin. And if you've not listened to that teaching, uh, please make time to make note of that, and you need to hear that study. It'll help you in many, many ways in understanding what it means to live uh, free from sin in the various categories of sin. But let's move on to this difficult, controversial, often asked question through the history of the Christian church. What is the unpardonable sin? As we've already covered in our introduction today, the most fundamental lesson of sin is that sin separates us from a holy God. Uh, if you're unsaved, and, and you might ask, what do you mean, are you unsaved? Well, in John chapter 3, the Bible says, Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. There has to be a time in your life when you repent of sin and receive salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be born again. And if you've never done that, then you're still living under the curse of sin. And God doesn't want you to live under the curse of sin. He wants you to live under the blessing of salvation and to receive and to live in all of his covenant favors. That's God's will for you, but it's your choice. There's only two things you can do with Jesus Christ. Number one, you can receive him, or number two, you can reject him. And at the end of this teaching, as I always do, if you're not sure that you're right with God, if you've never received salvation, if you're not uh, certain in your heart that if the Lord were to come today that you'd be ready to go, or maybe you are living in sin and you know you're living in sin, but you want to come home to Christ, I'm going to pray the sinner's prayer with you at the end of this teaching, and today can be your hour of decision, and I hope that you'll prepare your heart for that. Even as you're listening to the teaching, I always tell people, just softly in your heart, pray and say, Father, will you give me the faith and the courage and the humility to pray that sinner's prayer and to turn from sin and to receive Christ? I want to be a child of God. I want to be born again. I want to have that peace in my heart that it is well with my soul, and you can have that today. Now, the believer may sometimes sin, and that does not violate your salvation, but all sin can hinder your proper fellowship with God. We must always desire to enter in uh, to the house of God, into the presence of God uh, with humility and with a clean heart. Now, those of you that are taking notes, let's get into the very meat and core uh, of this biblical question. What is the unpardonable sin. Uh, this has been a conundrum to Bible scholars throughout the years, and uh, it's amazing how many multitudes of people in my 40-plus years of ministry and travel all over the world, 56 countries, many, many, many times I've had people that have come up to me with a fear that they could not be saved that they were eternally lost because they may have committed the unpardonable sin. Uh, as I'm speaking about that, I think uh, of, a, of a gentleman. Uh, the last I heard, he's gone home to be with the Lord. This happened many, many years ago. He was in his probably mid-70s at the time. It was a church that I was familiar with. I had ministered there uh, several times through the years. And he was actually one of the deacons uh, in that church. 
And as I got to know him a little through the years, uh, you couldn't have known a finer man. He was a true gentleman and kind in spirit and uh, gracious. And uh, to my knowledge, on a surface level, uh, you would have thought if there ever was someone who was a prime example of living a Christian life, uh, this man would have fit that description. He came up to me during an altar time and I had given the invitation and people had come forward to receive Christ and the uh, counselors were at the altars praying and helping those that had received Christ. And uh, But I had opened the altar time open for prayer and other people were around the altars and places of prayer and I was down front praying with people and he came to me and he said, can I speak to you privately? And I said, well, of course. And so we walked over uh, to a place where people couldn't hear and he got all teary eyed and he said, Tiff, when you gave the invitation today and you asked, are you sure that you'd be ready to meet the Lord if he were to come today? He said, I have to admit to you, I've always struggled through the years because I didn't get saved until I was in my early 40s. And I've always struggled through the years wondering if perhaps I've committed the unpardonable sin. And, and that's always haunted me. And uh, we had discussion and I explained to him uh, in a thumbnail as to what I'm going to give you a lot more detail on, on what the unpardonable uh, sin is, and I explained to him why it was impossible that he had committed that. And for some of you today, I'm going to help you to understand, because some of you, I think, would be like that deacon in that church, that there's this haunting question that may be in your life outside of Christ, that you had committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, that you had committed the unpardonable sin. And every time this subject comes up, it just kind of haunts you. Well, what if I have committed the unpardonable sin? And countless numbers of people through the years uh, sadly have, have been tormented uh, by this. Let's, let's go uh, back to verse 30. And uh, in verse 30, let's take a careful look at what Jesus said in context. He's addressing the Pharisees because the Pharisees have just accused him of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, or you may have a translation that says Beelzebub, or you may have a translation that says Satan. But in essence, that's what the Pharisees have accused Jesus of. They said, you're casting demons out by the power of Satan. Uh, Jesus makes an interesting statement because he said, well, if that's true, then who has enabled your sons to cast out demons? Uh, well, that's important to us from a theological standpoint because that helps us to know that exorcism, the ministry of exorcism, uh, was available outside of Christ. And we know that to be true, that uh, in church history and in uh, other uh, books outside of the Bible and in, in, in biblical history and first century historians, people uh, were demon-possessed and the ministry of exorcism, which is the casting out of demonic spirits that possess in, of individuals, that there were individuals who had the ministry of exorcism other than Christ. And Christ actually acknowledges that some of his contemporaries uh, and he refers to them as the sons of the Pharisees. And whether it were literal sons, that's not in context from original language uh, what it would mean, but he would mean your contemporaries, uh, other Pharisees, Pharisees who came before you, Pharisees who uh, perhaps are living now, who have also been involved in the ministry of exorcism. Uh, who have they cast out demons by? Uh, do you have the same standard of judging your own exorcists by the same judgment and condemnation that you have pointed to me? And so Jesus is responding to the Pharisees. And so once again, very important to understand who's speaking. This is Jesus speaking. Matthew's recorded it, but he's recording an actual conversation of Christ. Who is Jesus speaking to? 
He's speaking to the Pharisees. Uh, And in verse 30, uh, Jesus said, anyone who isn't with me opposes me. And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. Pause right there. Uh, You're either a child of God or you're a child of sin and Satan. There's no in-between with Christ. You're either a child of God or a child of Satan. You're either living under the blessing of God or under the curse of sin. That's why I always emphasize, no matter what I'm teaching or what I'm trying to show you from the Holy Scriptures, you need to know that your heart is right with God. And we're going to pray that prayer together in the moments ahead. Verse 31, so I tell you, Every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which will never be forgiven. Verse 32, anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, either in this world or in this world to come. Now, let's get back to an answer that some of you have probably heard. Uh, When asked, what is the unpardonable sin? Most of the time, you're going to hear someone, if they know the scriptures, you're going to hear this type of response. They're going to take you to verse 24 uh, of this passage, and they're going to say, Jesus said that blasphemy is declaring the works of the Holy Spirit to be the works of the devil, uh, because that is what the Pharisees did. And indeed, uh, the Bible tells us that when the Pharisees heard about the miracle, they said, no wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. Now, here's where the mistake on this subject has been made, and here is where much confusion uh, arises from this passage. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. On the subject of what is the unpardonable sin, I'm going to give you a solid gold nugget, and I'll repeat it a couple of times so that you'll have time to write it, but I want you to write this down. More important than what the Pharisees said was the condition of their heart and mind that could utter such a statement. More important than what the Pharisees said. And this is why people get focused on the words. Well, it's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. They're just concentrating on the words in the scripture that record what came out of the mouth of the Pharisees. But if you're writing it down, more important than what the Pharisees said was the condition of the heart and the mind that could utter such a statement. Because verse 25 tells us that Jesus knew their thoughts So again, as we always strive to teach you the fundamentals of proper biblical interpretation when reading and studying the Bible, uh, text in context, context within the narrative of the, the entire book. But when verse 25 tells us that Jesus knew their thoughts, that should have drawn the intelligent reader of Scripture to the mind. Jesus was also speaking and discerning the condition of their mind. When the scripture said Jesus knew their thoughts, that takes us beyond just the words that came out of the Pharisee's mouth. For the Bible goes on to tell us, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, when the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, it's not talking about the biological organ that we know is our human beating heart that 
keeps us alive. It's talking about the seated conscience of man, the very soul and spirit of man. That's why in Proverbs and the fourth chapter, the Bible says, above all, guard your heart. The spirit of the inner man, the spiritual inner man, above all else, guard your heart, for out of it are the issues of life. In Proverbs chapter 4, when the Bible says, above all, translated from the original language, uh, that's about as powerful a priority as we could render that into English verbiage. But when the Bible says above all, think of the power of that. Think of the weight of that. Above everything, guard your heart, for out of it are the issues of life. And Christ, in dealing with the Pharisees, knew their mind. He knew their heart. He knew their motives. He knew their intent. And so the very text tells us that Jesus was not focused just upon the words that came out of their mouth. He was focused upon where those words came from. In other words, he moves from beyond audible sound and words to the spiritual condition. What is the spiritual condition of the Pharisee's heart and the Pharisee's mind that they could utter such a condemning and judgmental statement against the very Son of God. Now, I should give further detail on that because I think, uh, number one, you deserve to understand this in deeper context, but you also need to know uh, that this is uh, not my opinion. This is not my interpretation. Uh, I think most of you that follow our ministry and have listened to us teach uh, when we exegete the scripture, we literally pull it apart almost word for word. And when necessary, we'll pull it apart word for word uh, from original languages. As I always tell you, it's not important uh, that you become a Hebrew student or a Greek student or that you understand these biblical languages or as you've heard me teach through the years, the actual Hebrew of the Bible is a dead language. Uh, and the actual Greek of the New Testament uh, is a dead language. These two languages in the Bible, and of course we have passages in the language of Aramaic as well, but these are not the languages that are spoken today. The Hebrew of the original Old Testament is not the Hebrew that they speak in Israel today and parts of the world. And the same with Greek. The Greek that was in the original New Testament manuscripts is not the same Greek that they would speak today in Greece or in other parts of the world. So I want you to see something a little deeper here. I want you to go to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. And then I want you to go down to verse 11. And there the Bible says, and this is speaking of the Apostle Paul, Acts 26 and verse 11, what I'm about to read is speaking about the Apostle Paul. He said, many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. Now the them are Christians. Uh, we know that Paul the Apostle, before he was converted, uh, was Saul. And Saul was a persecutor of the early church and Christians. And so in Acts 26, 11, he's admitting to that. He said, many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme as a religious. Now he was in the spiritual hierarchy of, of the hour prior to his conversion, Saul uh, was a Pharisee. Fall, Saul was one of the most educated, uh, learned men of his hour. Uh, thank God for his conversion and that God anointed him and used him uh, for his full spiritual destiny. He actually uh, recorded and wrote and authored almost one third of our New Testament that we have today. But uh, Paul admitted that he tried to force people to blaspheme. 
Now let's take it one step further because Paul confessed that he committed blasphemy. All right, let me show you that in the Bible. Uh, go over to 1 Timothy, the Apostle Paul's very first letter to his son in the ministry, uh, Pastor Timothy. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and go down to verse 13, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, Paul said, even though I was once a blasphemer, he admitted it, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. So if the unpardonable sin, as people oftentimes just kind of impulsively repeat out of our text in Matthew's gospel, and it's not that they're erroneous, it's not that they're, I'm not saying they're heretics, but they haven't given the complete story by just saying blasphemy is declaring the works of the Holy Spirit to be the works of Satan. Now, by now you should already have understood and should have uh, documented in your life notes that Jesus proved that by going beyond the utterance of the audible words that came out of the mouth of the Pharisees and had discerned their thoughts. Jesus went deeper than the words. He went to the mind and to the spirit and to the heart. What is the condition of a man's heart, a man's mind that would allow him to speak blasphemy? We already know that Jesus has focused upon this and this further underpins what I'm teaching you. How do we know that? Because if blasphemy were declaring the works of the Holy Spirit to be the works of Satan, and that alone were the unpardonable sin, then how do you explain Paul? I read to you in Acts that Paul forced people to blaspheme, and then in 1 Timothy 1, he admitted and confessed that he was a blasphemer. He had committed blasphemy. But he was forgiven, the Bible said. So obviously it can't just be declaring the works of the Holy Spirit to be the works of the devil and that's it. That's the unpardonable sin. How do we know that? Because Paul committed blasphemy. But what did the scripture say in 1 Timothy 1 and 13? He said, though I was a blasphemer, though I committed, Paul said, I committed blasphemy. But he said, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. So the Bible here clearly, I mean, uh, I quite frankly think I could teach this to children in Sunday school and they would understand that this is not complicated. The Bible clearly divides the Pharisees' blasphemy from Paul's blasphemy and Paul had once been a Pharisee. So they both audibly had blasphemed but Paul was forgiven, but these Pharisees were not. So by that, we're able to absolutely uncover through the integrity of properly interpreting the scripture that it's not just the words of declaring the works of the Holy Spirit to be the works of the devil. It's deeper. It goes to the heart. It goes to the spiritual condition. It goes to the mind and the Bible clearly tells us that Paul found mercy. Why? Because he did it in ignorance and unbelief. All right, pause right here. And this is something you need to have in your notes. There are people who have committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost who, like Paul, did it in an unsaved, ignorant, innocent condition. No idea as to what they were doing. No full understanding spiritually as to the judgment that the Pharisees had exhibited in Matthew 22. And so like Paul, they can be forgiven. Let's just kind of give you a final thumbnail on that. What is the difference between the Apostle Paul and the Pharisees? The Pharisees had heard the teachings of Jesus. 
Uh, I want you to write these things down because this is the very crux of the matter as we come to a conclusion. The difference between the Apostle Paul and the Pharisees. Why were the Pharisees accused of committing the unpardonable sin, but Paul, who had done the same thing, not accused of committing the unpardonable sin, and not only not accused, but forgiven, called by God then to be an apostle, and then used to write almost one-third of the New Testament that I hold in my hands. The difference between the Apostle Paul and the Pharisees. Number one, the Pharisees had heard the teachings of Jesus. You see, when Paul had committed blasphemy, he had never heard the teachings of Jesus. He had yet to fully understand. He had heard about but had not fully spiritually heard with spiritual ears. It's one thing to hear with a physical ear. It's another thing to hear with your spiritual ear. It's one thing to hear with the natural ear of a natural man or a natural woman. It's another thing, like in Revelation, where the Bible says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. When the Spirit speaks, it speaks beyond the physical ear, to your inner spiritual ear. Once you receive biblical truth through the spiritual ear, there's a different level of accountability that's attached uh, to that. So, number one, the Pharisees had heard the teachings of Jesus. Number two, the Pharisees had been eyewitnesses to the miracles of Jesus. They not only heard his teachings, but they saw the demonstration that validated his teaching. Number one, they heard his teaching. Number two, they were eyewitnesses to his miracles. Number three, they had heard the invitation of Jesus to turn from sin and to turn to God. Very, very important that you not only understand these three things, I hope that you'll have these in your life notes, and I'm going to go over them again, because this is the very heart of the matter, and this is where we begin to see the full biblical understanding of what is the unpardonable sin. Jesus, in Matthew 22, discerns their thoughts, so he's not just focused on the words that came out of their mouth and the blasphemy by the audible words of declaring the works of the Holy Spirit to be the works of Beelzebul or Beelzebub or Satan. But he goes beyond their words to where did the words come from? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Three things that separated the Pharisees from Paul and why the Pharisees will suffer the judgment thereof. Again, number one, the Pharisees had heard the teachings of Jesus. Number two, the Pharisees had been eyewitnesses to the miracles of Jesus. And number three, the Pharisees, one-on-one, personally, had heard the invitation of Jesus to turn from sin and to turn to God. And after these three things, the Pharisees rejected him publicly. Very important. They rejected him publicly, as they did in this passage that I read to you. Not only did they reject him publicly, they declared his ministry to be the work of Satan. Wow. Wow, that's heavy. If you understand that, that's weighty, weighty, weighty. They had heard the teachings of Jesus. They had seen his miracles, his signs, and his wonders, which validated his ministry. They had received a personal invitation from the Son of God himself to turn from sin and to receive God, faith in God. But they rejected him publicly. And not only did they reject him publicly, they judged him publicly. And they declared his ministry 
to be the work of the devil. So I hope that you've learned that Paul committed blasphemy. So we know that blasphemy, declaring the works of God to be the works of the devil, blasphemy in and of itself is not the full answer to this by any means. It's only the door to the household of truth given to us in the scripture, which we're uncovering for you. Paul committed blasphemy just like the Pharisees, but he said, I was shown mercy because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. The Pharisees weren't ignorant. They heard the teachings of Jesus. They saw the miracle signs and wonders of Jesus and they publicly judged him, rejected him, declared his work and ministry to be that of the devil. So in conclusion... I want to help you with something because there might be individuals and uh, I'm sure there will be hundreds and potentially through the years, if the Lord tarries, I don't know how many thousands will uh, listen to this in recent months, uh, these teachings through podcast and through video and through Facebook and YouTube have had uh, approaching uh, one and a half million listens and views. So certainly there will probably be hundreds and thousands of people who will hear this that you've wrestled with what I've heard a lot of people wrestle with through the years. Don't miss this. You've wrestled with maybe I've committed blasphemy. Maybe prior to my salvation or maybe you're not even saved yet, but hold on because we're going to pray for you. And today you can publicly repent of sin and receive Jesus Christ and have a knowing in your heart that you're right with God. Wouldn't you like to lay your head to the pillow tonight, maybe for the first time in your life, and know that you have peace with God? No matter what's going on in the world around us, I have total peace. Because prophecy has already outlined an absolute pathway as to what's going to happen in this earth. And we as children of the living God have peace because we are under the protection and covenant of God And the next major prophetic event, which is the rapture of the church, will soon take us from this corrupt world into a place of everlasting and right relationship with God the Father. I look forward to it. I want you to have that peace. But here's the question that hundreds and thousands wrestle with. What if I have committed the unpardonable sin? What if it's too late for me, Tiff? All right. Uh, Again, I'm going to give you a gold nugget and some of you might want to write this down because whether you've asked this question or not, maybe one day you'll have someone that you're witnessing to or praying for uh, that struggles with this subject and wonders if they've committed the unpardonable sin. I want you to write this down because this will help them and this will give you the answer to help them. If you have a spiritual concern, And I'll repeat this a couple of times so that you can write it down. If you have a spiritual concern that you may have committed the unpardonable sin, it is the strongest evidence that you have not. Exclamation point. Let me say it again. If you have a spiritual concern that you possibly have committed the unpardonable sin, it is the strongest evidence that you have not. Exclamation point. Now, why would I close this teaching with such a statement? Because once a person has committed the unpardonable sin, they never again will hear the voice of God. Once a person has committed the unpardonable sin, they will never again feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Once a person has committed the unpardonable sin, they are permanently and irrevocably spiritually deaf and spiritually blind. Get ready for this fifth one. Once a person has committed the unpardonable sin, 
they are given over to a reprobate mind. And a reprobate mind can never again receive any communication from God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. They become completely immune to the preaching of the gospel or to a biblical witness. They're beyond hope. They have crossed a line of no return. Now, I obviously wouldn't leave you with a cliffhanger and introduce to you the subject of a reprobate mind because I know that Uh, Many of you would write me and email me and private message me on social media. And your obvious question is, what is a reprobate mind? Well, you'll be perhaps happy to know that that is going to be our next teaching in this series of Hamartiology, the theology, the study of sin. I'm going to devote an entire teaching to what is a reprobate mind. And so when you conclude this teaching and you feel like you've thoroughly understood and received all that we've taught from the scripture, then I want you to go through the archives and look up what is a reprobate mind and we'll pick up with where we're leaving off today and then we'll go into the definition biblically and the biblical study of what is a reprobate mind. But if you have, Don't miss this. If you have any fear, any concern, any conviction, that haunting question, what if I perhaps have committed the unpardonable sin? What if I, in my previous life before salvation, uh, did that? I, I, I declared the works of God to be the works of the Holy Spirit. Remember Paul and the Pharisees. And remember what I very carefully articulated and defined from Scripture that Paul was forgiven. The Pharisees committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Paul confessed he committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. The Pharisees had committed the unpardonable sin. Paul was shown forgiveness and mercy because he was innocent and ignorant and did it in unbelief and not realizing what he was doing. Because it's not just the words audibly of declaring the works of God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit to be the works of Satan. It's the condition of the heart, the mind, the spiritual condition. What would be the spiritual condition of an individual who could utter such judgment and utter such words? Paul found forgiveness. And if you have any concern at all, you'll find forgiveness. Because if you had committed it to the extent where it were truly the unpardonable sin, then there's no forgiveness. There's no spiritual conviction. There's no spiritual concern. The fact that you have concern is proof. It's the strongest evidence that you have not. But nonetheless, you need to turn from sin and turn to Christ. So let me close and then we'll pray. I want to give you uh, a brief summation of what is the unpardonable sin. And uh, I hope that you'll also take the time to listen and re-listen to this and be sure to secure this and write this in your notes. The unpardonable sin is an attitude of the spiritual heart that says, I am going to reject God. I have heard his word. I have seen his power. I have felt his presence. I have received his invitation to turn from sin and turn to God, but I'm going to reject it, and I'm going to live life my way. That's exactly what the Pharisees did. And that is a biblical and proper definition of what is the unpardonable sin. Let me give it to you one more time. The unpardonable sin is an attitude of the spiritual heart that says, I'm going to reject God. I heard his word. I have seen his power. I have felt his presence. 
I have received a personal invitation to receive Christ, to turn from sin and turn to God. But I reject that. And I'm going to live life my way. That's what the Pharisees did. And that is the unpardonable sin. May none who hear me ever cross that line because it is a point of no return. If you've ever been to New York State, on the western side of the state, near the Canadian border, is one of the great wonders of the world, Niagara Falls. Leading to Niagara Falls is a river called the Niagara River. And uh, I've driven by it, I don't know how many times through the years. I've crossed the Canadian border there into Ontario to minister in Toronto and Ottawa and various parts of Canada. And I've seen it, I don't know how many times. But I've also seen a place on the river where there are two large signs painted in bright white and red. And the last time that I saw them, they were painted point of no return because many people use the Niagara River for recreation and uh, for fishing and swimming and boating. But if you're not paying attention and the river as it gets closer and closer to the falls, it quickens in pace and uh, the current becomes quite strong. But there's a place on the river with large signs on either bank that say point of no return. Because once your boat gets past those signs, unless you have the proper power, even with a motorized boat, the current at that point becomes so strong that you may never be able to get back up river and you're going to be swept over the falls and you'll die. The point of no return. Many people have been fishing and not paying attention and drifted past that only to be a headline in the paper of a family that died. I read not long ago, and when I say not long ago, a few years ago, of an uncle that took his nephew and his niece fishing. And they were fishing the Niagara River, and they were not being seductive and playing games and flirting with this line of no return. He actually had engine problems quite a, a ways up, but he had gotten too close uh, for someone that didn't have a secure engine, or at least a backup engine or as they often say, a kicker. And he couldn't get the motor started. And the boat drifted beyond the point of no return. The pace quickened. And sadly, that uncle that had taken his niece and nephew, both under the age of 10, on a fishing trip, ended up taking all three of their lives. How sad. The unpardonable sin is a point of no return. And my prayer for you is that you might live never flirting with the lines in life of no return, but that your heart's desire might always be to draw closer to God. Are you living for God? Are you living a holy life? Are you living ready to meet the Lord? He's coming very soon. Do you know that you know that you know that your sins are forgiven and that your heart is right with God? I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray with me right now a sinner's prayer. And it's amazing how many people in the days and weeks ahead will find this broadcast and will get to this point and realize their need for Christ and have the humility to come to Christ. Do it today. Do it now. Do it while there's time because there is a point of no return, not to mention Christ is coming soon. And at the sound of the trumpet, that is a point of no return as well. You need to make your decision now. Pray this with me. If you have any question in your heart, if you've never given your heart to Christ, if you're backslidden away from God, if you've gone through some situation in life 
physically, mentally, spiritually, financially that's caused you to get mad at God or to get mad at the church or to drift away from the Lord, come back home today. There's still time. Pray this with me right where you're at out loud. Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, I felt you calling to me and I want to receive Christ. I don't want to reject him. I don't want to face the judgment and the wrath of God. Today I choose forgiveness. I choose heaven. I choose Jesus. Heavenly Father, today I admit my sin and I repent in childlike faith I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus Christ. I receive salvation as the gift of God, not by my works, but because of the cross and the price that the Son of God paid. He died. He was buried. He rose again. He's coming soon. Today as I receive salvation, keep me ready for that soon return. I vow today I will live for Jesus Christ. I surrender all of my life, all of my heart into the hands of God who does all things well. And I trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh mm-hmm. 